Uh, we'll now move into what I truly believe is one of the favorite sessions of the dialogues. But as you look down, you're going to see a new face this year. I think that uh, Michael Scharf has moderated this panel from the very, very be beginning. And today we're seeing a, a passing of the baton, so to speak. But moderating the panel today will be Jennifer Trahan. Uh, Jennifer, and you can, we have a short bio in, in your materials, but she is the Clinical Professor of Global Affairs at New York University. So with that, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Testing. It's a tremendous pleasure for me to be moderating this panel, and thank you to David for asking me. And of course, I too am, am very saddened by the passing of Hans Peter Kaul, and I was honored um, to, um, to get to know him and uh, work with him a little bit. So we have an amazingly distinguished set of panelists. I think most of the audience knows who they are, so um, I will only briefly mention their um, uh, positions. So we have for the International Criminal Court, Prosecutor Fatou Ben Souda. For the Yugoslav Tribunal, we have Serge Bramertz. For the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, Hassan Jallo. For the Special Court for Sierra Leone, Brenda Hollis. And for the Extraordinary Chambers of the Courts in Cambodia, <coughs> Nicholas Kumdian. These truly are leaders in the field of international justice to whom the international community owes a tremendous debt of gratitude for their hard work and dedication. Not to mention the hard work and dedication of the prosecutors who preceded them, many of whom we have here today, including David Crane, Sir Desmond De Silva, Stephen Rath, Andrew Cayley, and of course we're also honored to have the deputy prosecutor of the ICC with us as well. Um, so I'd like to start the panel. I will have specific questions, but I'd like each prosecutor <coughs> to start by briefly summarizing, if you can possibly stick to about five minutes, the key accomplishments of your tribunal over the past year. And we will go in thi roughly this order, um, and then I'll come back to questions. So let me start with Serge. Thank you very much. Good, Good morning, everybody. Pleasure to see all of you. I have the impression that every year we have more and more participants. Uh, I hope <coughs> this will be reflected in the, in the support for international justice in general. So I will be very briefly try to say a few words about where, where we are at the Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. Um, I have the pleasure of, for being at those meetings for the last six, seven years. And the first years I was mainly complaining about the non-arrest of the key fugitives, um, Karadzic and Mladic. And uh, now, a few years later, I'm in the privileged situation to say that we're almost there, that we're almost at the end of those two trials, which are probably the most important trials in the history of the, of the tribunal. And interestingly, they are taking place not at the beginning when the tribunal was created, but at the end, uh, one of the reasons being that it has been so difficult to have the fugitives arrested, which is one of the big problems, unfortunately, we the other tribunals still have and we don't have to deal with. So we are in the final phase for the Karadish trial. The defense case uh, rested in May. Um, final briefs will be submitted uh, this week. Uh, final arguments presented in four weeks' time. And then we uh, hope to have a judgment somewhere before a summer next year. So I hope that they will be able to announce uh, uh, conviction uh, next year. Mladic trial a little bit more, more complicated in the sense that there are a number of health issues. Uh, trial is now in the defense phase. Uh, 30 witnesses already testified uh, for the defense, still 150 or more than 150 to go. We hope that the uh, trial there also will be over by summer next year, so it take, takes time. Um, there have been a number of developments and a number of uh, decisions in relation to those cases. It would go <coughs> too far to go into details, but perhaps only in relation to a reopening of the prosecution case we are asking today in the Mladic case in relation to a mass grave which has been discovered in September. All this to say for those who are not so familiar with the context, the crimes were committed between mainly 92 and 95 and still today every year a number of mass graves are discovered and so in September 
uh, a new mass grave was found, uh, more than 400 remains. We have identified more than 285 individuals so far, uh, more uh, to be identified. And we have asked uh, a reopening. Why? Because we think those are key elements in relation to the ethnic cleansing and genocide in relation to the municipalities. Those who are familiar with our jurisprudence know that in relation to Sherwenica, we have a number of <coughs> convictions for genocide because within three weeks, up to 8,000 men and boys were executed in three weeks' time in, in Srebrenica. But in relation to the ethnic cleansing campaign, in more than 50 municipalities, we have a number of convictions for persecution, for crimes against humanity, but never for, for genocide as such because the judges were of the opinion that the organized character, systematic character was not established enough to speak about genocide. We think we have a last chance uh, to um, support uh, uh, the uh, genocide charges. Why? Because the modus operandi, which uh, is becoming clear, shows that those mass graves have been prepared uh, days and weeks before the executions took place. So much more organized character of those killings in a number of municipalities. So we will see what will happen there. But the important uh, thing here is really that even 20 years after the conflict in a region which is relatively peaceful nowadays with a big international presence and countries which are getting close to the European Union, even there we are finding 20 years after the crimes uh, a mass graves, which shows one of those big, big problems uh, all of us are uh, confronting. In relation to the jurisprudence, um, I want to mention two elements very briefly, uh, and I understand we will have perhaps a discussion afterwards. One in relation to specific direction. You remember perhaps that uh, we went through a very big frustration in the office of the prosecutor, and I think uh, larger than that, after uh, an acquittal in relation to uh, General Perisic at the appeals chamber at the ICTY. To make a long story short, uh, he was the chief of staff of the Serbian army in Belgrade. He had been prosecuted, indicted for aiding and abetting, providing substantial support to the military forces in Bosnia, knowing that they were committing massive crimes. He was convicted in uh, first instance um, by majority of judges, but he was acquitted in appeals because the majority of the appeal chamber was of the opinion that although it was established that he had provided substantial support in terms of logistic, uh, financial support, and that he was aware uh, of the commission of crimes, but that he had not specifically directed uh, the support towards the commission of crimes. And because he was considered as being a remote perpetrator, because he was in Belgrade and not on the crime scene, uh, a higher threshold was applied by the appeal chamber, and uh, um, we were very shocked when uh, he was, uh, was acquitted. Um, in the meantime, there has been the uh, Charles Taylor trial. Uh, there has been Sarinovic trials, so two trials in appeal with a similar uh, legal situation where we were very pleased uh, in the interest of international justice and in the interest of the victims, but also of our host office, to see that this specific direction was not maintained, where a large majority of judges has decided that this specific direction notion is not in line with international humanitarian law, is not supported by our own jurisprudence, and is in fact creating more confusing, confusion than, than helping uh, anybody else. I can say more about it later on. Last element, I, I know that five minutes uh, are almost over, is in relation to um, sexual violence related jurisprudence. Uh, it's an issue we are discussing very, very often, and um, uh, I hope that when I'm coming next time, I will have a study with me. We are now finalizing uh, at the ICTY about our good and bad experiences over the last 20 years in conducting sexual violence investigations. What have we done well? What could we have done better? So we are um, preparing a quite ambitious uh, publication for next year. Um, I, I hope you will, will be interested in it. And we had an interesting jurisprudence, which unfortunately was not very much reflected in, um, in, in the media. Um, and it's the following. Uh, we had a, a few acquittals in, in first instance where um, we prosecuted for killings, for uh, extermination, for, for looting and for sexual violence where uh, there were convictions in, in all areas with the exception of sexual violence where um, the uh, judges were of the opinion that um, it was not established that the sexual violence was part of the campaign of ethnic cleansing um, and we were uh, very pleased to see that in, in appeals we um, 
got these um, acquittals overturned and where the judges were of the opinion that uh, those crimes were foreseeable, that from the moment that um, commanders, that military and political responsible are sending uh, the soldiers into a situation that uh, the sexual violence as such is a foreseeable crime and should be treated exactly uh, at, in the same manner as uh, the other foreseeable crimes like uh, uh, lootings, uh, uh, killings, and other crimes. So this was a quite uh, interesting uh, development. Those who are interested, I can of course send those decisions because it is, it is of course, as you can imagine, much more, much more complex than I'm saying. And last word, we are still very much working with the prosecution offices in the former Yugoslavia, where in our final phase, where we will probably close within two, three years' time. Um, next week, I'm again in Sarajevo. There are still 2,500 cases to be conducted. We are trying to, to support capacity building initiatives and training in the former Yugoslavia to make sure that those cases will continue. Uh, because I'm absolutely convinced that uh, the success or wealthy fa failure of our tribunal will very much depend on the way how those cases will, be, will continue in the former Yugoslavia and how much the international community will maintain pressure to make sure that those cases are, are moving forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hassan? Thank you. Thank you. As you may be aware, this, is the, this was the 20th anniversary of the genocide in April of this year. And later on in the year, in November, we'll be commemorating the 20th anniversary of the establishment of the Rwanda Tribunal. Uh, it's taken some 20 years of work to try and bring justice and accountability to what happened in Rwanda in, during those dreadful 100 days in 1994. The tribunal is at the stage where we have now completed all our trials at first instance, and we are now focused on finishing the appeals and also on legacy work. We have actually argued all our appeals now, uh, except for one case, which is the, what we call the Butare case. The Butare case cons uh, involves uh, six accused persons who had been convicted by the, by the trial chamber and sentenced to various, various terms, life imprisonment to other fixed terms. Uh, it, the case has the dubious distinction also of including the only female who has been indicted for, for international crimes. And ironically too, she was the minister of responsible for women's affairs, indicted with, with rape and convicted of rape as well, together with her son. Uh, both of them are involved in this case. We expect that the, the, the hearing in that case will take place in December, uh, scheduled by the Court of Appeal, and that would be the last case for, for the ICTR. So the, the estimation is that by September of next year, the, the decision would come from the Appeals Chamber and the Rwanda Tribunal would close down uh, within 12 months from now. Um, we have argued other appeals and judgments are, are scheduled to be delivered in end of September uh, ne ne next month. Uh, that's where we are. With regard to the past 12 months, uh, we've had some good news. We've also had some disappointments in relation to some of our cases, especially high-level people who had been convicted by the trial chambers. Um, we had two senior government ministers, former government ministers, who had been convicted by the trial chamber being released on appeal. We've also had two former senior military officers convicted by the trial chambers being released on appeal as well. Basically, the reasoning of the appeals chamber being insufficiency of evidence or uh, the appeals chamber coming to a different appreciation, drawing different inferences on the, on the, on the facts uh, than, than the trial chamber did. We did have a, fortunately, we were able to maintain the conviction against Augustine Bizimungu was the former chief of staff of the armed forces. And if you, if you had watched Hotel Rwanda, you may, you may, be, you may know about uh, who Busy Mungo was. He featured in that, in that particular movie, or somebody representing him, I suppose, <laughs> featured in that, in that movie. Um, it was a very welcome decision, uh, both in terms of maintaining the conviction and also maintaining the sentence of 30 years. 
there was a disappointing part of it of the appeals chamber judgment though which we chose not to disturb the current legal position regarding the responsibility of a successor commander to punish for, for punish a subordinate punish a subordinate for offenses committed when he was not the commander uh, what had happened in this particular case was that Bizimungu had taken over command four days after being aware that some of his some sub, some of the soldiers had committed serious crimes and when he took over he was aware of this and he failed to, to punish them he could not have prevented because he was not the commander at the time but we argued now that he is the commander he can punish them the appeals chamber came to a different conclusion on the basis that effective control was required at, on both instances for the successive commander to be responsible of course in our view that creates certain gaps which allows uh, people to slip through uh, and, and, and not not be punished so it was a bit of a mixed bag but there were the good sides and, and the disappointing sides we've been focused also on the legacy aspect of our work trying to to identify and uh, and, and publish some of the lessons which we think need to be to be learned from the work that has gone on over the past 20 years we've published um, a manual of best practices on tracking and arrest for fugitives we've also published uh, a manual on the investigation and prosecution of sexual violence in situations of conflict and both both documents I'm happy to note are now being used by the Interpol as training material for national jurisdictions this is really the essence of this best practice project to identify ways in which the job could be done better based on our on, on some of the difficulties we faced so that other international courts and national jurisdictions can, can learn from these, uh, the, 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 these experiences. We're still working on other aspects of best practice. We hope to publish later this year a manual on uh, the empowerment of national jurisdictions to enable them to investigate and prosecute uh, international crimes based on our experience in the referral of cases to, to national jurisdictions. And we think this would be this manual would be of relevance, of course, to the implementation of the complementarity principle on which the ICC is, uh, is based. The manual would show, in our view, what, what needed to be done in order to empower national jurisdictions to, 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 to live up to this, what is now their own primary responsibility. Uh, all these projects we anticipate will finish before the ICTR closes uh, in September of next year. But it is clear that the tribunal will close uh, within the next, next 12 months. There's a little bit of work left over, of course. We still have nine fugitives. Uh, six of them have had their cases referred to Rwanda for trial. And so Rwanda bears the primary responsibility of tracking them. Three, the other three have their cases referred to the successor mechanism, which now takes over responsibility for their tracking and for their prosecution uh, in, in the event of arrest. Um, we have sent out invitations to the events uh, which will mark the 20th anniversary of the tribunal this year and I look forward to seeing many of those if not all the invitees participate uh, in those proceedings thank you very much thank you, thank you. Um, thank you very much and good morning to you all um, Always very happy to be here with you. Um, my colleagues keep talking about winding down and closing, so I'm <coughs> getting worried that maybe in a couple of years I'll be the only one sitting here. <laughs> <laughs> and that the dialogues will be monologues. <laughs> we, joke, <laughs> we joke about that. Uh, but uh, for the ICC, uh, it, it has actually been a very challenging, a very hectic, but also a very dynamic year um, this past year. And the work at the ICC has been not only uh, incredibly demanding, but also unrelenting. I think with everything that is going on uh, around the world, this is uh, understandable. And, but I do believe that this second decade of the 
of the ICC and the court's operational existence is a very critical period in the life of the institution and that it's incumbent upon us, uh, those uh, who are there, to ensure that we do our level best to advance the mandate of the court and to also strengthen the public confidence uh, in the activities, in our crucial activities. And to this end, as far as my office is concerned, we have instituted a number of significant changes and I thought it would be um, important for you to, to, to take note of these changes that have taken place, not only at the organizational level, but also at the policy level. And we're doing all of this with the aim of enhancing our efficiencies and especially our delivery groups. Um, we have engaged in a very serious and committed manner to improve the quality and also the effectiveness of our key preliminary examinations work, our investigations and prosecutions activities. Um, but at the same time, to also develop policies and the operating procedures. Um, <coughs> and this is done, of course, we, we, we need to hone our performances. We had the strategic plan of 2012 to 2015, adopted in, in autumn and last year. And this, I think, is a concrete example of such efforts that reflects an entirely new approach to our core activities. Let me start with the strategic plan um, and the preliminary examinations. We have, of course, realized the importance of preliminary examinations and the strategic plan ensures that we place a stronger emphasis on, on this aspect of the office's work. In addition to establishing whether reasonable grounds exist uh, to proceed to an investigation, <clears throat> the aim of the preliminary examinations is also to promote genuine national proceedings and also the prevention of crimes. With respect to the strategic plan and the changes to investigative and prosecutorial strategies, the office's investigative and prosecutorial strategies have also undergone tectonic changes. Um, let me cite a few examples of what we have done. We are now increasingly diversifying the forms of evidence on which we rely. And we're moving away from the previous position of uh, relying heavily on witness evidence. In particular, we are looking to enhance our capabilities and also um, make sure that looking into this di diversified form of evidence, such as forensic, for instance, forensic evidence and analysis, we are, we are concentrating more on that in the office. We are also shifting, um, another thing we are doing is we're shifting away uh, from this focused investigations, which was a, a policy in the office, and we are moving towards in-depth and open-ended investigations to ensure that our cases are, are actually built on more solid basis. Um, and I should mention that uh, as a matter of practice now, what we do in the office, we religiously undertake comprehensive case reviews, and we do this throughout the life cycle of a case to test our hypothesis against the evidence that we have on hand. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid we were not doing that in this uh, systematic manner before, but now this is, uh, this is done uh, consistently. And also, additionally, where it is appropriate, we will look to prosecute lower and mid-level perpetrators and then move up, building a, a case against those most responsible. We are, of course, not uh, moving away from those most responsible, but we thought that it would be um, good to, if it is possible, start from mid-level and then, and then move up. We will also try to be as trial-ready as possible at the initiation of the judicial process, uh, such that by the time we request for an arrest warrant or at the latest, at the confirmation stages uh, of the proceedings, we will be as trial ready as possible. 
Um, and ever since uh, assuming my mandate as the prosecutor of the ICC, we have engaged in a robust recruitment campaign to be able to hire more experience and top talent. In, uh, in particular, I've been focusing on the investigation division and the prosecution division, but also other divisions, including, for instance, my immediate office. Um, we are ensuring that the joint teams uh, that we have in place are now headed by the senior trial lawyer, who has, of course, vast domestic and or international uh, criminal experience. Previously, the leadership, uh, um, maybe some of you will know, was um, a, a three-man leadership of uh, each division, and I think that has uh, um, been difficult to, to, to manage. On policy developments, this has also been taking place in the office. Um, we have been focusing on policy development uh, culminating in the adoption of a code of conduct for the office. And this is a detailed code that provides very clear guidelines for the Office of the Prosecutor Staff to uphold an impeccable standard of professionalism, of efficiency, of independence, and integrity in the performance of their, of their duty. And uh, this is particularly important for me. It is a code that of course, applies equally to myself and my deputy, James. Um, and I have already ensured that all the staff members in the office have undergone training, um, mandatory training on the code, and James and, and myself have also undergone training on this code. Another policy is the sexual and gender-based crimes policy, which in June of this year, um, I launched the policy on sexual and gender-based crimes. It's a very comprehensive document, which um, uh, there was a lot of consultations before it was uh, finally adopted, both inside and uh, externally. And I think it is a demonstration of the offices uh, and my personal commitment to enhancing the integration of a gender perspective in all of the areas of the work of the office and to being innovative in our investigations and prosecutions of these very serious crimes. And I believe, I hope that this document will also serve as a reference guide for states and other relevant actors. We're also looking to do an official launch, probably within the margins of the um, Assembly of States parties, which will take place in New York this year. There is also the children's policy. Um, we have just embarked on a consultation uh, process for the development of a children's policy. And my office will soon again be seeking external input and, and views, and I would be pleased to benefit from your contributions in this upcoming policy. The policy on the prohibition against attack against cultural, religious, and educational buildings and monuments. I am similarly uh, developing this comprehensive policy to assist the office in the methodological investigation and the prosecutions of these crimes, which are um, crimes of directly attacking buildings that are dedicated to religion, to education, to art, to science, or charitable purposes, or historic monuments. With respect to the office restructuring, um, we have done some ad hoc organizational changes. They've already taken place. But I'm also considering a revision of the structure and the organization of the office. Um, this will come uh, soon. With respect to the preliminary examinations, uh, activities, and the cases, another important development that relates to the office's core activities um, is opening of new preliminary examinations, which we have undertaken recently in Ukraine, in the Central African Republic, and in response to a self-referral from the Central African Republic and also in Iraq. But um, this has brought the number of preliminary examinations that we have had to 10. And much progress has also been made in moving some of these preliminary <coughs> examinations to the next phases, um, culminating, for instance, with the closure of the situation 
um, in the Republic of Korea. With respect to investigations, we are at different stages and uh, it is continuing in eight situation countries. Regarding the courtroom proceedings, uh, in March, Jamin Katanga was convicted of war crimes and crimes against humanity, and a crime against humanity. In May, he was sentenced to 12 years imprisonment. The judgment in that case is now final, following the withdrawals uh, of appeals by the parties and the discontinuance of the respective appeals by the parties. In June of this year, 13 charges of war crimes and five charges of crimes against humanity were confirmed against Boscon Taganda. And the trial in that case will start later, later this year. Four charges of crimes against humanity were confirmed against Lohan Bagbo, former president of uh, Cote d'Ivoire. And we are preparing to go to trial now. Charles Blegoudé, who was also charged in the events that took place in Cote d'Ivoire, was surrendered to the court this year in March. And the confirmation of charges for Charles Blegoudé is scheduled to take place in September, next month, uh, I think 22nd of September. I believe that this, uh, uh, and I'm sorry if I'm taking long, I think naturally I should take long. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that uh, some of these uh, positive developments uh, demonstrate in part that I believe we are heading in the right direction with the uh, implementation of the office's new strategic plan. And there are also, these are also good news, I believe, for the victims who have so much, who have suffered so much at the hands of these perpetrators and who have for so long and continue to yearn for justice. A more troubling phenomenon that we have seen during the past year, last year, and also this year, is the increase in the number of cases involving witness interference and witness intimidation. And in particular, in the context of the Kenya, Kenya cases, the Kenya situation. Uh, you will understand that this is a new challenge that the office faces, and I believe it directly threatens the integrity of the court's proceedings to which we have had to pay particular attention uh, with no option but to devote existing resources to investigating these crimes, these Article 70 uh, investigations as we, as we call them. And the result is that it has put additional constraints on the resources of the office. Um, in, the case of the, in, in the context of the case against Jean-Pierre Bemba, for instance, five arrest warrants have been issued, <coughs> including for Jean-Pierre Bemba himself, for the offenses against uh, the administration of justice, what I just mentioned, the Article 70 offenses of the Rome Statute. We have had good cooperation, thanks, thanks to the Netherlands, thanks to Belgium, and to the Democratic Republic of Congo. Three individuals were simultaneously arrested in three countries while the other one was uh, later on subsequently uh, surrendered to the court by, by France. So we're grateful to the state parties for that. We're preparing now for the confirmation of charges for these, uh, for these cases. And in the Kenya situation also, an arrest warrant has been issued against Walter Barasa, a national of Kenya, but the warrant is still pending, pending proper execution. What the, 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 the Kenya situation or this Article 70 cases involve is, is that it involves putting in place teams, complete teams, that would have um, investigated our core crimes. And what it does, it pulls away resources from, from the uh, resources we need to investigate and, and prosecute the, the crimes under the, the Rome Statute. But it remains vital with regards to cooperation and the challenges that we face, we have to have, we have to continue to have cooperation from state parties and partners. But this cooperation we keep emphasizing has to be timely and it has to be tangible. We, this is what we keep asking states, that this uh, cooperation has to be timely when we need it and it has to be substantive. 
when, when it is given. Arresting these individuals against whom the warrants have been issued continue to remain a major challenge. And to date, we have 10 individuals that are yet to be, to be arrested. Warrants have been issued against them. Another challenge that the court, uh, and I think I mentioned this uh, uh, all the time, is the misperception and the lack of knowledge about the court is a big challenge. It continues to be a big challenge. Um, and we can only explain so much as a court, as officials of the court uh, to the world. We can only explain so much. But unfortunately, what happens is that a vacuum is created by our inability to reach out to, the, to all corners of the world. We can't do that. And that vacuum is filled by the skeptics, it's filled by the critics, and they continue to fuel the misperceptions about the court and the work of the court. So there is much that supporters of the court, from academia, the media, the civil society, the legal profession, just to name a few, I think there is much that they can do in this regard to help continue to raise awareness about the court and about the crucial mandate that the court uh, faces. I could go on. I, I really could go on and on about, about the court and elaborate, but I think uh, I, I will stop. <laughs> I will stop, and I thank you for this opportunity. Brenda. Thank you. Now we'll talk about the little engine that could and did the special court for Sierra Leone. And I'm very pleased to be here again this year, and this year in my capacity as the prosecutor of the residual special court for Sierra Leone. And in the past year, I believe that the office of the prosecutor has been very gainfully employed, and I believe has given a good value for each dollar in the budget. But I think there are two events of primary importance since the last dialogues that I would like to discuss. And the first of those events occurred in September of last year when the Special Court Appeals Chamber delivered its unanimous judgment in the appeal of the Charles Taylor case. And in that unanimous judgment, the Appeals Chamber affirmed all convictions <coughs> and the 50-year sentence of Charles Taylor. Now, in addition to its historic value, there were really two aspects of that judgment that I would like to bring to your attention today. And the first aspect deals with the proof requirements of aiding and abetting. And Serge has talked to you about the Perisic case. And last year when I was here, I noted our concern about that majority decision which we believed was inconsistent with customary international law, the jurisprudence of the two ad hoc tribunals, and also was a very confused uh, majority decision. Our appeals chamber found that specific direction is not an element of aiding and abetting under customary international law, and reaffirmed that what the prosecution must prove is that the accused acts substantially contributed to the commission of the crime and that the mental state that is required is the mental state of knowledge or an awareness of the substantial likelihood that the accused acts would assist the commission of crimes. We believe that's a very important uh, decision for the jurisprudence of aiding and abetting. We believe that the specific direction jurisprudence is one that would, in essence, allow top-level perpetrators to basically have impunity for their actions. So we were very happy uh, to have received that decision from the appeals chamber. The second uh, aspect of that case that I believe is worthy of note was of particular significance to me because it's a position I've been arguing since I began at the Yugoslav Tribunal in 1994. And that is, the appeals chamber found that there is no hierarchy among the forms of liability set out in Article 6.1 of our statute. That is to say, there is no hierarchy among the forms of liability of planning, ordering, instigating, committing, or aiding and abetting, but that rather, when determining a sentence, it is individualized sentencing, and so the court must look at the gravity of the crimes, 
the extent and consequence of the totality of the accused criminal misconduct and, of course, the personal circumstances of the accused. And I believe this also is a very important uh, jurisprudential decision uh, by this appeals chamber. In addition to the appeals chamber decision in the Taylor case, the other significant event that occurred uh, at the Special Court for Sierra Leone was that in December of last year, the Special Court became the first international criminal court since Nuremberg to close its doors. The Special Court was replaced by the residual Special Court, which has the responsibility of carrying out the continuing functions of the Special Court. And those include dealing with enforcement of sentence, dealing with issues raised by prisoners, dealing very importantly in my mind to ensure the continuing protection and support of witnesses and victims, maintenance of the court archives, and in particular for the prosecutor of the residual special court to be able to respond to state requests for information. When the special court closed its doors, we had one outstanding indictment, and that was against the chairman of the junta that had overthrown the elected government of Sierra Leone in 1997. We have conflicting information about this man, Johnny Paul Caroma. We have information that he is dead, indeed killed on the order of Charles Taylor. But we also have continuing reports that like Elvis Presley, he has been seen in various places throughout the world. Um, so he may be alive. Uh, if indeed he is alive, if he's located and turned over to the residual court, then if we are unable to refer his case to a state for prosecution, then the residual court would have the ability and the mandate to uh, try this one uh, outstanding indictment. The residual court is a very lean mechanism. We share an administrative platform with the Yugoslav Tribunal, and we have, we owe great thanks to the Yugoslav Tribunal and to Serge's office for their continuing support, which was substantial throughout the life of our court. Uh, we have a permanent seat in Freetown, in Sierra Leone, but we have an interim seat in The Hague, the Netherlands, and that is in fact where we carry out our duties and where our archives are placed. Since the residual court has stood up, my primary job has been to, to put our prosecutorial functions in place to recruit the one full-time position that I have, and that is the prosecution legal advisor and evidence officer. And we have also been very engaged in completing our archiving so that we can do comprehensive searches as needed, responding to five state requests for information uh, three of them very complex requests, filing two submissions giving our perspectives on and our opposition to the prisoners, two prisoners' requests for early release. We were unsuccessful in both of those uh, situations. They will be released early uh, with conditions. Uh, and we also uh, asked the president of the court if we would be allowed to make submissions on Mr. Taylor's motion to the court that he be allowed to serve his sentence in Rwanda instead of in the United Kingdom where he is currently serving his sentence. Uh, and that motion of his and our response to the disposition of that issue uh, is pending as of today. But I think the special court was able to, to close its mandate uh, in large part because of the leadership we had of the principals of the court. Uh, several of them are here with us today, the former prosecutors but also the very, very hard work and dedication of many people who worked throughout the years in that court. And I would like to extend my thanks to all of them for a job truly well done, uh, and I believe a court that will um, add significantly uh, to the fight against impunity and to the international body of jurisprudence in relation to international crimes. Thank you. Two and a half weeks ago, on the 7th of August, the Extraordinary Chambers for the Courts of Cambodia delivered judgment
against the two most senior surviving members of the Khmer Rouge regime. Now this was a judgment on a severed portion of the indictment in that case. So it dealt with limited charges related to the initial transfers of the population in April 1975 uh, from, from Phnom Penh. Approximately two million people were forced out immediately when the Khmer Rouge occupied the city <coughs> and transfers later that year between rural areas of Cambodia and one massacre that occurred in the, in the first transfers. The court convicted the two accused of the, the various crimes that they were charged with, including murders and exterminations related to those transfers, the deaths of many unknown numbers, but hundreds of individuals during the transfer from Phnom Penh. So we're very pleased with that, and now we'll be moving on towards a appeal in that case, which undoubtedly will be quite complex and will take some time. But at the same time, we're preparing for the trial of the remaining charges in that case. We call this the, the case against Kusampan and Nunchia, the two surviving senior members, was called case two. So 2-1 two was the first trial, the judgment we just received, and 2-2 two two will be the, the next trial. And that will deal with all of the remaining charges. <clears throat> These include the persecution of religion, of, of Buddhists throughout the country. It includes all of the security centers, including the um, tortures at Tulslang, the famous museum that some of you have been in Phnom Penh and undoubtedly have visited, where about 16,000 individuals were taken there, tortured, and killed. It also will include forced marriages that occurred during the Khmer Rouge regime, where at times dozens, at times even hundreds of couples were forced to get married, often to people they had never met, and to the rapes that occurred when these individuals were forced to consummate their marriage. Also remaining are the genocide charges. In, the, in, in Cambodia, as you all know, the uh, Genocide Convention does not include political groups, but includes racial, ethnic, national, or religious groups. There are two genocide charges pen pending, the genocide of the Vietnamese in Cambodia and the genocide of the Cham Muslims. So I think one of the things that uh, is probably not well appreciated around the world, but I think is of great significance in modern times, is that we have now a case pending where the United Nations funded and supported court is engaged in prosecuting people for genocide against individuals because of their belief in Islam. Uh, and I think that's going to be a very significant case. <clears throat> While this is going on, we also have investigations continuing in two other cases. These are investigations that many of you know the history. Um, they were proposed by the international side of the court, and Cambodian court is a tribunal, a mixed tribunal, where there's both a national prosecutor, an international prosecutor, national investigative judge, and international investigative judge, and the judges of the trial chambers are mixed. There was a disagreement between the internationals and the nationals as to whether or not these individuals qualified under the statute as senior and more, and most responsible for the crimes. But in the last year, these investigations have been continuing by the international side, but the investigations have not been impeded in the, in the year that I've, the 10 months that I've been there. Well over about 300 interviews have taken place in the last year. And uh, on one of the cases, case four, the prosecution made an additional submission to the judges asking them to expand the investigation a bit to cover in case four forced marriages that occurred in the particular areas that are the subject of that case and rapes that occurred, both those from the forced consummation of the marriage and rapes that occurred outside of forced marriage. And this relates to what um, I believe it was Serge talked about some recent cases at the ICTY and the issue about when leaders give orders 
for things like the torture and execution of young women. Is it really a foreseeable result or is it a surprise? Is it something they cannot be held responsible for if those women are also raped? Uh, it's been found in the initial investigation of case two, the, the closing order said that it was not a policy of the leadership in the Khmer Rouge for sexual violence to occur. They were rather puritanical in their attitudes about sex. But clearly, in our view, when you take young men, often teenage soldiers, give them complete control over women and girls, even to the point that they're allowed to torture and execute, that we believe that they can be held responsible, the senior leaders, for the rapes and sexual violence that occur. So there's much work that remains done in the, uh, to be done in the extraordinary chambers. We're operating, like all of the courts, under extreme budget duress, uh, but we hope that we'll, the funding will continue and we'll be able to bring the court to a conclusion that will serve the interests of the victims in Cambodia, <coughs> which are really the entire population. Anyone born before 1979 was affected. Anyone born after 1979, their parents, their grandparents were affected. It's affected them. So we think a, a, a court that's dealing with the killing of an estimated 1.7 million people deserves to continue and to reach a just verdict in those cases. Um, thank you to our panelists. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Um, let me start with some specific questions. You know, David Crane said I could play a bit of a devil's advocate, so I'm going to try to do that. Yes, you did. Um, so. Um, Serge already discussed the, the problems of the Perisic decision, which clearly Brenda agrees with, um, by seeming to add a third prong to what is aiding and abetting, um, the specific direction. In other words, if you don't specifically direct arms to criminal uses, you get acquitted. Which, or if it's a, it's a purely uh, criminal enterprise, well, you never give arm, you would rarely give arms to a purely criminal enterprise. So what they have effectively done, it seems, is eviscerate aiding and abetting in Perisic. But much as we agree with the, the fallacy of the reasoning, um, the unfortunate consequence is it's resulted in a really high level acquittal um, and um, th that is going to, uh, to stand, and there's been one as well in the Gotovina case, and we probably would also agree in our um, if criticism in the logic of Gotovina. It seems a bit puzzling, but um, all of this has resulted in these incredibly high-level acquittals, and hasn't this controversy been harmful for the overall legacy of the Yugoslav tribunal and in actually an unfortunate day for international justice. See the question? <laughs> um, well, I think it will be for others to decide what has been helpful and not helpful in the reputation of the tribunal. And um, as prosecutor, of course, I'm absolutely convinced that uh, what will be important to us successful with the two remaining cases and if we are successful until the end with the Karadzic and Mladic trials having serious convictions. I hope that uh, will be what is remembered. Of course, we were very frustrated with those two, two acquittals. Uh, but, you know, as a prosecutor, it's always a little bit delicate to publicly criticize decisions coming from, from appeals judges. Uh, as much uh, as, as, uh, as I said, we were unhappy with those two Two, two decisions, and I admit very easily, and I think I said it last year, that in my 25 years of career, it has never been so difficult for, my, for me to, to, to not publicly react stronger as, as I have already done in relation to do those two decisions, um, because um, not only th that I don't think that they are, ref are reflecting the reality of the evidence, but also very much the, the way they ca came out. You know, the, for both decisions, there are very short appeals decisions, both came out after very short appeal t appeal, uh, appeals hearings. And the frustration is that, you know, after, for both cases, two or three years trial with uh, 
200, 300 witnesses with thousands of artifacts presented as evidence in court, securing convictions, and then having, after one or two hours appeals hearing, a 30-page um, decision, which is absolutely not convincing, with very strong dissenting opinion, which are using a language like this is a mockery of justice, this has nothing to do with justice, makes it, it very difficult. So I think that um, I will not uh, discuss about the, the rumors and the merits uh, of the case, but the perception at least that things were not going the way they should have gone, I think this has been, uh, been negative, uh, but I hope it will have no no long-term impact. In relation to uh, the uh, Perisic decision, uh, when the uh, Charles Taylor decision came out and the Shainovitz decision came out, where in a very long explanation analyzing international law, national law, uh, jurisprudence, uh, the ICDY appeals chamber differently composed came up with a totally different decision, really saying that, that there was no support anywhere for specific direction. Uh, we went for, uh, w with a motion for reconsideration because we went to the same appeal chamber uh, presided by, by, by President Miron to say, look, uh, obviously uh, there is uh, an error. Uh, obviously the theory you have applied is not supported by, 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 by other tribunals. So we want you to reconsider your decision because we had also a lot of victims organizations and uh, scholars saying, how can it be that at a tribunal two appeals chambers, which are at the same level, are coming up with two totally different decisions. In a national system, you would have a Supreme Court, which we would make sure, sure that you have one, one final, final decision. So in terms of, of interest of, of, of a good administration of justice, we went for a motion for reconsideration, where one can argue that there is not sufficient legal basis to, to, to put a, a motion of this nature forward. But we had to put it forward before the same appeals chamber, and, and of course, uh, uh, the president uh, rejected our, our motion. Um, but um, as I said, this is now the past. We cannot change it anymore. It's extremely frustrating, but uh, I, I really hope that at the end of the day, people will look at the larger picture, uh, the 161 indictments, uh, some major decisions uh, in relation to command responsibility, some major development in, in, in the jurisprudence, uh, uh, so I hope at the end of the day it will be positive. Thank you. Um, Prosecutor Jallo, so there are two 11 bis transfer cases now in Kigali, Uwankindi and Munyagashari. And as you mentioned, there are nine fugitives and six would have their trials also transferred to Kigali. Given both Gachacha as well as domestic trials in Rwanda have basically achieved only one-sided justice and that is justice for the crimes and the genocide, but no look at counter killings. What is the legacy of this one-sided justice? Does it leave a stable Rwanda? And what are the key challenges to the Rwandan judiciary in adjudicating these upcoming cases? Well, in relation to the, to the ICGR, to the Rwanda tribunal itself, I think we, we have to recognize because that all international tribunals have limitations. They can't prosecute everybody. They are not meant to prosecute everybody. They, they prosecute a limited number of, of, of accused. And so a, a choice, a selection has to be made by the prosecutor based on certain con considerations, on considerations of gravity, uh, on, on whether there are other options for dealing with, with those cases other than prosecution at the international tribunal. And uh, on our part at the ICTR, looking at all those considerations, um, we, we recognize, of course, that the genocide is the main crime base of what happened in 1994. We have not been able to prosecute every person who played a leading role in the genocide itself. There are many other people still walking around who, who need to be, to be dealt with. Uh, we looked at the, the allegations against the RPF, which is this issue of one-sided justice. We did our investigations. And we, there was one case which we decided could go to court. And uh, I did decide that that case would be prosecuted in Rwanda because I, I, I believed that it was important that the Rwandan authorities are seen to be prosecuting their own senior military officers within the country in order, in order to try and dispel this criticism of one-sided justice. That's why you then had uh, four senior officers, Rwandan senior officers, two generals, 
and I believe a major and a captain who were prosecuted in Rwanda at our request. Two of them were convicted of these offenses. So we, we've done on our part some, some work in this particular area. We are aware also that the Rwandans did some work in, in this particular area. We have transferred cases to Rwanda, it's true, but I, I did receive information that the Rwandans also prosecuted before their military courts a number of soldiers, ranging between 30 and 40 actual military officers, who were accused of what they call revenge killings. Re revenge killings. And, and, and so the Rwanda itself uh, has done uh, some work in this particular area. Regarding the, what needs to be done there uh, uh, in the legal system, um, we of course had to carry out a lot of capacity building and working with the Rwandans encourage them to reform their, their legal system, uh, which eventually helped in convincing our courts to transfer these cases to that jurisdiction. There is a continuing need, of course, for capacity building, and the, the ICTR is up to now engaged in providing training, support for investigators, for prosecutors, for defense counsel, and for judges in Rwanda in order to make sure that they are uh, they, are, they are familiar with the principles of international criminal justice, but also that they, they can carry out fair trials uh, in, in, the, in that country for the cases we refer to them and for, for the other cases that arise locally as well. So, um, Prosecutor Bensuda, so you, you spoke a good deal about your strategic plan, which um, because it's apparent to many of us, you, you certainly have a tremendous amount on your hands with um, eight situations, just for the audience, those who, who may not be aware. Uh, DRC, Uganda, CAR, Darfur, Kenya, Libya, Cote d'Ivoire, Mali. Ten preliminary examinations, Afghanistan, CAR, Colombia, Comoros, Nigeria, Georgia, Guinea, Honduras, Iraq, Ukraine, a tremendous amount on your hands. Um, in addition to the, the work you've summarized in, in formulating the strategic plan, what, are you, what other principal challenges do you see in handling this? And I think Prof Ambassador Intelman's remarks suggested you may even have you know, more situations and more uh, preliminary examinations headed your way. Do you have any way to strategize your priorities of the situations? And do you have criteria for prioritizing within situations? Um, I, I think I went um, at length to talk about the strategic plan of, of the office. And it is within the context of this plan that um, the office is also adjusting the organizational structure, the capabilities, in order for us to optimize the performance and also organize our work and our activities uh, as efficiently as possible. And th we, I believe that through this enhanced coordination, having clear reporting lines and more effective managerial oversight by myself uh, as head of the organ, and in, addi in addition to also having very dedicated uh, uh, um, int integrated joint teams, I, I think I spoke briefly about the joint team per situation, also led by a very serious, uh, uh, very experienced senior trial lawyer. We are hoping that we will be able to manage uh, this situation in the best way uh, <coughs> possible for us and also within the confines of the resources that we have uh, at our disposal. But I think that even though, <coughs> even as we make progress, we, we require the support, we continue to require the support of states. This is uh, absolutely important, states parties and particularly for adequate funding, funding, funding of the court, funding on, of our activities. I think uh, for us to be able to achieve our goals, we simply need these resources to enable us to execute the mandate very efficiently and effectively in accordance with the, in accordance with the Rome Statutes legal framework. We can do much, but there is so much that we can do uh, for us to be effective and to be able to deliver high quality uh, cases. And what we need for that really, it's, it's a budget that, that uh, mirrors these efforts and mirrors <coughs> this, uh, I think it is absolutely key and absolutely necessary 
that we have the budget to be able to do that. So <coughs> to Prosecutor Hollis, the Charles Taylor conviction was a tremendously key accomplishment of the court. And I know it was not your responsibility, but the fact remains that the court prosecuted a total of nine individuals. And this is for a conflict where our trademark crimes were the hacking off of limbs or ears or lips. Um, and these, these first-hand perpetrators basically don't end up getting prosecuted because your mandate was to prosecute those who bore the greatest responsibility. But by virtue of the Lome amnesty, um, the Sierra Leone special, the Sierra Leone domestic courts basically have not tackled this impunity gap. How do you see the court's legacy and impact? Does it leave a lasting foundation on peace and respect of the rule of law? It is uh, where justice is successful, yet it is limited. I think that's a, a very good point, and it's um, perhaps the greatest challenge for states and the international community, and that is that no matter how hard you work, no matter how generous the funding, international courts uh, really cannot carry out their uh, mandate with the lowest level direct perpetrators. You simply cannot. Uh, you do achieve, I think, stability and justice in a country uh, by removing those who were bore the greatest responsibility uh, for these crimes through their leadership because you remove them from continuing involvement and destabilization in these countries. So I think that is the uh, benefit as well as, of course, uh, providing some measure of justice for victims. Uh, that is a benefit of international courts. Um, and I think that will be the legacy of the Special Court for Sierra Leone, as indeed, to a greater or lesser extent, I think it will be the legacy of all of these international courts. But who we leave behind are the people who very often still live in communities with their victims and very often flaunt their crimes and what they have gained from those crimes and taunt their victims. Uh, and I think what happened in Sierra Leone, to me, just reinforces my very strongly held belief that amnesties and immunities are not good for lasting peace and they're certainly not good for accountability. Because people, I believe, yearn for some measure of accountability for wrongs done to them. And when you basically give blanket immunity, then you deprive the state of the ability to do what is a basic tenet of the ICC, and that is try these crimes yourself. And how do people live together when there is no accountability? So I think it's a flawed idea that if we give immunity, somehow we'll promote peace. Maybe the international community can move on to another crisis, but the victims remain behind with their perpetrators in place and no real remedy for that. Um, but I think the international courts, their legacy, first of all, for all these courts, how well did you carry out your judicial mandate? That's your job. Mm -hmm. So how well did you do that? Don't judge them by other measures, judge them by that. And to what extent did they promote stability by removing those who are most likely to destabilize the country by pursuing their private greed and lust for power after peace agreements? And, uh, and quite honestly, in Sierra Leone, there was an independent survey, and most people in Sierra Leone believe that the special court had carried out its mandate. It had promoted justice and reconciliation in that country. Thank you. Um, to Prosecutor Kumdian, um, you referred to um, the recent verdict, which I guess you called case 2.1, and you're about to come to 2.2. So for 2.1, you, the convictions, um, you receive life sentences for individuals in their 80s. Um, can you, how significant is it to reach 2.2 and why? And uh, what are the difficulties? That, that, I mean, we've all seen the Yugoslav Tribunal and Milosevic die in the course of his trial. And of course, then really there's very little you can do wi with any of the results of that trial. Um, what are your concerns here? Well, I think the concerns are obvious, but how significant really is it to do 2.2 in this situation? You know, we're sitting here in, uh, I guess we're 
Harbor, this event is associated with the Jackson Center. The event last night was associated with the Jackson Center. And I think if you look back on Nuremberg and the tremendous legacy that that court had, the effect it still has today, was it because, I forget how many, seven men were hang hung or 20 men were convicted? Was that the fact that these men spent X number of years in prison? Is that the legacy of Nuremberg? No, the legacy of Nuremberg is about the process of finding justice, and it's about, very much important, is the recognition to the victims about what happened to them. Uh, in all of these cases, when we're dealing with senior leaders, it's very rarely the direct perpetrator, the person that killed someone's mother or son or sister. But victims, I find, and I think academic surveys that talk to them find, feel that they want to live in a society that has recognized what's happened to them. And if there is a court that actually brings justice and recognition for hey, this conduct by senior leaders was criminal and they should be held responsible, I believe it has a subtle effect on the whole society. People believe we live in a place where some justice is possible, where it's not just simply a matter of who has the most money or political power or guns in order to control or ruin the lives of others. So I think it has a, a tremendous effect. Now in this case, the two accused are 83 and 88 years old now. Obviously their health is a concern. We're trying to accelerate this second trial that deals with the most serious charges of the regime. One of the important ways we, we were doing that is we asked the judges and they agreed that all of the evidence from the first trial is already on the record. This is already evidence that's been tested by the accused, their counsel. Uh, it's already, they've already had the opportunity to participate in it. And that evidence includes the key linkage. And those of us, uh, all of us have worked on war crimes trials know that the most difficult part of proving any case against senior leadership is not that the crimes happened, but how are those crimes linked to the leadership? The evidence about how decisions were made in the Khmer Rouge regime, how they were communicated from the center to the zones, how reports came back to the senior leadership, all that is already in existence from case one. So we hope that we can then complete the trial in the second case. There have been surveys where people have gone out and spoken to the victims and asked them, you know, is it important to you that these cases go on? And, and, and they, they pretty much the great, great majority say it's very important. I myself have spoken to victim groups and they've expressed great importance, uh, the, the great desire to see these cases happen in the lifetime of the accused and in their own lifetime because many of the victims are elderly also. Thanks. Um, I might hop around a little bit. I think we're reaching, I can do a second round of questions. Yeah. Um, so let me stick with Prosecutor Kumjian. So the international community seems very much to endorse the notion of a hybrid tribunal as the way of the future. Um, yet I think the ECCC experience has shown that when the international community couples with the domestic judiciary, they inherit it warts and all. So for a domestic judiciary that has struggled with problems of independence for the executive, um, you know, that, that poses certain challenges for a hybrid in those situations. How would you assess the ECCC's legacy and impact given the problems of executive interference? Well, if we're talking about the cooperation of states with an international tribunal, I think we can go down the line and each one of the prosecutors here can talk about issues about uh, the difficulty in international courts getting full cooperation from states involved. That is simply a reality um, of the system now. Uh, there still are sovereign states and international courts, international justice is something that is separate from that. There, there is no super sovereign United Nations that rules over states. Um, the way to deal with it individually, I think, all of us, and I think everyone here has done that, is to be true to yourself and the integrity of your own decisions. And I think all of those in actors that I find, that I know at the international at the ECCC now uh, have done that. 
they uh, will make their decisions on their own. There are disagreements between the prosecutor and co-prosecutor on certain issues, between the co-investigating judges, and between the trial chamber. But what I found is that, at least in the time I've been there, they've been expressed rationally by all actors, and uh, the, there are mechanisms in the statute to hopefully resolve in some way those disputes. Um, Hassan, if I can ask you, so I was recently traveling in Rwanda and I was very disappointed to find that most Rwandans did not have a favorable impression of the ICTR. Um, for some it just seemed distrust of the international community, um, going back to the um, failure to intervene in 1994. Um, Many expressed a, a certain preference for simply Rwanda during trials, whether it's gachacha or domestic, at least to those I spoke to. Has the ICTR's outreach made missteps? I mean, I realize Rwanda has at times presented a very difficult relationship. Um, could, could outreach have done better? Is there more work for outreach still to do to reach the people in Rwanda? The, the distance between the ICTR in Arusha and, uh, you know, and Rwanda, of course, has contributed to, to a misunderstanding on the part of many Rwandans about the ICTR. In the initial years, I must admit that our outreach program was not very effective in bridging this gap in, in, we created by, by the distance. Uh, things have improved considerably. Um, we, there is a very active outreach program. We have developed many centers now of information, ICTR centers of information within Rwanda itself, which are accessible to all Rwandans. And we have a major center in Kigali, the Umusensu Center, and 10 other centers scattered around the country, which provide information on what we are trying to do. So I think the, the gap is being bridged much more effectively now, but because uh, certain things which happen in Arusha, the ICTR also, um, do, do contribute to this hostility uh, on the part of some Rwandans towards the tribunal, especially the acquittals. Acquit when acquittals of senior people occur, it causes quite a, a furore in, in, in Rwanda. But we try to explain to them that, well, this is the nature of the judicial process. Um, we can't end up with convictions of everybody. The judges are independent. They have to take, be left to take their decisions <laughs> on the basis of their appreciation of the evidence and, and the law. And if that leads to an acquittal, we have to respect those decisions. Because after all, within Rwanda itself, in the Gachacha system, they have a higher acquittal rate than we even do in Arusha. I think they have about 40% acquittal rate within the Gachacha system. That has been a kind of bone of contention, which has created difficulties between the tribunal and the, and the public in Rwanda. But we tried to stress to them, as I said, that, well, you can't have a process which leads to a conviction of everybody. Then it lacks credibility and it becomes suspect. And we have to respect also the decisions of the court. Um, to Prosecutor Ben Sira, um, this, we don't have too much time left, and I know this is a big question, but the ICC has had a very contentious relationship with the AU, or maybe the AU has had a contentious relationship with the ICC, I'll phrase it that way. Um, as a result of the Kenyatta case, um, can the ICC repair this relationship going forward? Um, <coughs> certainly the relationship between the uh, ICC and the African Union is, is a very, is critically important and uh, certainly we are hoping and aspiring to have even stronger ties um, with, the, with the AU. In fact, what we are doing at the court now is um, we are trying to engage with the AU at all levels, uh, at, at, at different levels uh, and engage with them as much as possible. We hope that by doing this we'll be able to um, clarify we will be able to give information, and uh, we will be able to correct as, as much as we can the misunderstandings that have deliberately been created by, of course, the interested, those who have an interest in doing so at the, at the African Union. And just to give you an example of this uh, interaction, 
we are organizing, um, or we have actually just uh, finished in, in, in a, a series of seminars, joint seminars, between the uh, ICC and the African Union at the technical level. We are working very closely with the uh, legal council, the African Union's legal council. And this seminar took place, I think, in July of this year um, at the, in Addis Ababa itself. Uh, and we were able to, I think it provided a very useful uh, form to constructively discuss with the African Union the work of the ICC. And what I have been doing at the, personally at my level is also I have tried to reach out as much as possible to the highest level, the heads of state. And uh, uh, in a forum like, for instance, the General Assembly, I would uh, come to New York where most of them would be here attending. And I would meet uh, uh, many of them and discuss the issues of the ICC, but also I've undertaken personal missions to their capitals to, to discuss um, and talk to them about the work of the ICC. Especially, I recall last year when there was this threat of mass withdrawal of African states from the, from the ICC. And somehow, uh, I, I, re I received very positive uh, reassurances personally from them uh, and also get messages of commitment from the, from the head of state. But it, it, I think it should be, we should note that at the operational level with individual African states, we make a lot of requests to them. <coughs> as, as you can see, most of our cases, if not all of our cases are there. And over 50% of these requests are made to African governments, African states, and they respond positively. Uh, contrary to the belief that uh, there is a complete shutdown of, uh, of cooperation with the, with the African states. And uh, as you can see also, that many African states still continue to seek uh, the involvement of the ICC. I, I think uh, this year alone we've had uh, the uh, Central African Republic again making a, a self-referral to, to, to the ICC and asking for ICC's inter, inter, intervention. But I still think also, having said that, that more can be, <coughs> can be done both from the side of the ICC and also from the side of the African Union to be able to improve uh, our relations and cooperation. Um, I think the truth <coughs> is that accountability for mass crimes and the deterrence are very vital for the stability, they're vital for the security, and the prosperity of the African continent, of all continents, whether we, uh, it is accepted as such or, or, or not. And uh, I think this recognition was, was very much alive when Africa played a very prominent role. We all recall the role that Africa played in the establishment of the, of the International Criminal Court. And I believe this is a truism that really needs to be embraced again. Uh, this is, uh, and for me, for the office, um, as far as we are concerned, uh, we are certainly ready and will continue to engage with the African states, we will continue to engage with the African Union. But let me conclude by uh, just answering the question that uh, uh, you, have, you have said. I, I think that um, through the very principled, professional, and the consistent uh, conduct of our affairs as an office, as an institution, and to be able to execute our mandate uh, to fight against impunity wherever we have jurisdiction, and to do so without fear and without favor is, uh, is, is absolutely crucial for the credibility, the continued credibility of the, of the court. And I am hoping that uh, as a prosecutor, by, by the time I, I continue, I, I finish my, complete my mandate, which has just started, I, <laughs> I, I hope that not only the African continent, but uh, the whole international community will look to the institution with great respect, with great admiration, and, and uh, would hope that uh, will continue to be the important component of uh, the fight against imp impunity, but also to, um, for the international rule of law 
and also to deter, especially to deter the commission of these very, very serious crimes uh, against humanity. So uh, one last question to Prosecutor Brammertz. Um, so as with all international tribunals, you um, could not do the vast bulk of the crimes yourselves, but have to now rely to na on national judiciaries. Um, even though with 161 cases, I think yours is the most fulsome example of an international justice mechanism. Um, can you describe your work with the, uh, with the domestic prosecutor's offices in the, the different ones in the region? And as, as well, perhaps you have reflections. Um, your tribunal has no fugitives, um, and this was achieved through a long process of conditionality, and are there lessons learned when states want to get serious about arrests? Um, do you have any suggestions to draw um, for the examples? questions. Um, um, let me start with, with the second one in relation to fugitives. Uh, indeed, very often on conferences, we are, uh, you know, the proud